Welcome back, everybody. Today we will be reading Chapter 3. So, let's get into it. Chapter 3. Anderson didn't immediately send his crew chasing after the fleeting mercs. As soon as they lost visual contact with their enemy, pursuing them turned into a fool's game. Every corner, turn, or branching hallway they'd come across would represent a chance for a potential ambush. Instead, Da, O'Reilly, and Lee took up defensive positions guarding the passage in case the mercs came back, possibly with reinforcements. With the only point of insurgents, uh, insurgents covered, Anderson and Shea were free to examine the bodies. They'd killed ten mercs in the battle. Now they were picking through their corpses, a ghoulish but necessary denouement to every engagement. Step one was to identify any wounded survivors who could pose a potential threat. Anderson was relieved to find all of the downed figures were already dead. It wasn't Alliance policy to execute helpless foes, but taking prisoners would have introduced a whole new set of logistical problems to a mission that was already complicated enough. The next step was to try and identify who they were working for. Five of the dead were Batarians. Three were humans, and two were Turian. Eight males, two females. Their equipment was a hodgepodge of military and commercial arms from a wide variety of manufacturers. Officially recognized military units tended to be made up of a single species and carried only one brand of weapons and armor. The inevitable result of corporations signing exclusive supply contracts with the overseeing governments. These were not most likely soldiers of fortune, members of one of the Verge's many freelance mercenary bands that hired themselves out to the highest bidders. Most mercs had tattoos or brands burned into their flesh proclaiming their allegiance to one group or another, usually prominently displayed on the arms, neck, and face, but the only markings Anderson found on the fallen were indistinct splotches of raw, scabby skin. He was disappointed, but not surprised. For jobs where secrecy was important, crews often had their markings removed with an exfoliating acid wash, then reapplied after the mission, a simple but painful procedure that was charged back to whoever had hired them. Obviously, the group hired to attack Sidon had feared Alliance retaliation and done their best to remove anything that might expose them if something went wrong. There had still been no counterattack from the enemy by the time Anderson and Shea finished stripping the bodies of grenades, metagel, and anything else useful and small enough to easily carry. Looks like they're not coming out again, Da grumbled as Anderson came over to stand beside her. Then we have to go in after them, Anderson replied, slapping a fresh power pack into his kinetic shield generator. Generator. We can't wait out here forever, and there's still a chance we'll find some of our own people alive down here. Or more mercs, O'Reilly muttered, replacing his own power pack. The corporal was only saying what they were all thinking. For all they knew, there was another full enemy squad deeper inside the base, and the two men who'd fled the battle had already managed to warn the reinforcements. But even though they might be walking into a trap, they couldn't turn back now. The lieutenant gave the rest of the team a moment to gear up before shouting, Da! Shay, Take the point! Let's move out! They advanced into the rough-hewn hewn, hewn, rough -hewn passage, main main maintaining a standard alliance uh, patrol formation. The two marines on point up front, Anderson and O'Reilly three meters behind them in the middle, and Lee, three meters behind them, watching their backs. They all had weapons raised and ready as they made slow but steady progress through the uneven, irregular tunnel that had been bored through the rock. They were officially in a hot zone now, and caution was more important than speed. One moment of careless inattention could cost all of them their lives. Ten meters in, the corridor turned sharply to the left, the team stopped short at a hand signal from Da, who crept forward and poked her head around the corner, momentarily exposing herself to possible enemy fire before ducking back. 
When she gave them the all clear, they, they continued on. Beyond the corner, the passage continued for another 20 meters before reaching a sealed security door. The heavy metal barrier was closed and locked. Anderson signaled to O'Reilly, and the corporal moved forward to work his tech magic and override the lockdown codes. The rest of the team assumed standard positions for another flash-and-clear procedure. If those mercs are locking the security doors, Da whispered to, to her commanding officer as they waited for the door to open, then that means they have codes for the base. Someone on the inside must have been working with them. Anderson didn't reply, but he gave a grim nod. He didn't like the idea that someone inside Sidon had betrayed the Alliance, but it was the only explanation that made sense. The Mercs had known the facility was expecting an off-world shipment, and they must have had the proper landing codes to get their ships on the, the surface without raising any alarms. They'd been familiar enough with the layout to clear out the upper area and make their way to the elevators at the back without letting anyone escape. And they had to have access to restricted lockdown codes to seal the security door. All the evidence pointed to the inescapable conclusion that there had been a traitor at Sidon. The door slid open, and the team sprang into action, using a flash grenade to blind anyone on the other side, then charging in only to find the area beyond empty. They were now standing in a large square room, about 20 meters on each side. The shiny metal walls, ceiling, and reinforced floor made it clear they were now entering the heart of the, res of the research facility. Everything had a sleek but modern feel, a sharp contrast to the rough-hewn natural tunnels they had just passed through. There was a hall leading off to the left, and another to the right. I've got a blood trail over here, O'Reilly called out on the left. Looks fresh. We follow it, Anderson decided. Lee and Shay set up position here. He didn't like splitting up the team, but they didn't know the layout of the base. He didn't want any of the, the mercs doubling around behind them and making it back to the elevator. Da, O'Reilly, fall in. Leaving the two privates to guard the only way out, Anderson and the others set off down the hall on the left, moving even deeper into the research complex. They passed several more intersections, but Anderson wasn't willing to split his squad up yet again. Instead, the three of them simply followed the blood trail. Along the way, they passed a number of rooms, most of them small offices, judging by the desks and personal workstations. Like the dorms on the upper levels, each had been thoroughly ravaged by gunfire. The killing spree that began on the surface had continued unabated underground. And once again, the mercs hadn't been content to leave their victims where they had fallen but for some inexplicable reason had dragged them off. It was five minutes later when they finally came across the source of the blood trail they'd been following. A Turian lay face down on the floor in the middle of the middle si medium-sized room, bleeding profusely from a wound to his leg. Anderson recognized him as one of the mercs who had fled the recent battle. Approaching carefully, he knelt down beside the motionless figure to check for a pulse, but found nothing. There was only one other exit from the room, another sealed security door off to one side. Think his buddy's in there? Da asked, using her assault rifle to point to the closed portal. I doubt it, Anderson replied. He probably knew we'd be following the blood trail. I bet he ditched this guy at one of those other branches farther back probably waited for us to go by and then made a mad dash back to the exit. I hope Shay and Lee are on their toes, Da muttered. They can handle him, Anderson assured her. I'm more interested in what's behind this door. Probably leads to the primary research lab, O'Reilly guessed. Maybe we'll finally get some answers in there. They rolled the dead Merc out of the way. There was no sense taking the chance of someone tripping over his body if there was another firefight waiting for them beyond the door. Then, on Anderson's command, the corporal set to work overriding the security lockdown while the lieutenant and chief Daw took position for another flash and clear operation. Daw was the first one through this time, and once again there was nobody on the other side. Nobody alive, anyway. Sweet mother of mercy, she gasped. 
Anderson stepped into the room and felt his stomach lurch at the gruesome spectacle before him. O'Reilly had been correct. They were standing in an enormous lab dominated by a massive central server. The only way in or out was the door they had just come through, and like the rest of the base, every piece of equipment in the room had been blasted beyond all hope of repair. But none of that was what had evoked their reactions. At least thirty corpses were strewn about the room, most piled along the walls on either side of the entrance. Their uniforms marked them as Alliance personnel. The guards and researchers killed throughout the other sections of the facility. The mystery of where all the bodies had gone was solved, though Anderson still couldn't figure out why they'd all been dragged to this singular location. Check for survivors, sir, Da asked, her voice not holding out much hope. Wait, Anderson said, holding up his hand to freeze his team in place. Nobody move a muscle. Oh my god, O'Reilly whispered, just now recognizing that Anderson had already seen. The entire room was wired with explosives. Not simple proximity mines, but countless 10 kilo detonation charges placed strategically around the lab. For Lieutenant Anderson, all the pieces suddenly fell into place. There were enough explosives here to vaporize everything inside the room, including the bodies. That was why they'd been so carefully collected here. They'd, there'd be no way to positively ID the remains, meaning whoever betrayed Sidon would be presumably presumed dead with all the others. They could assume a new identity and live off the profits of their crime, with no chance of repercussions. A soft electronic beep made Anderson realize that finding the traitor was the least of their problems. Timer! O'Reilly hissed, his voice voice raw with fear and nervous energy. A second later it beeped again, and the lieutenant knew the dying Merc had lured them into a trap. The detonation sequence was counting down, and their fate, survival or death, would very likely be determined by the next order he gave. In the split second between beeps, his mind analyzed and evaluated the situation. The size of the blast from the explosives would be enormous, more than enough to destabilize the entire underground complex. It would probably cause a cave-in, collapsing the huge natural chamber back by the elevator. Even if they were far enough away to survive the blast, they'd run out of air long before rescue uh, workers would ever find them. O'Reilly was a tech expert. There was a chance he could disarm the trigger before it went off, if they had enough time to find it. And if there wasn't a backup, and if there wasn't a backup. And if it was a manufacturer he was familiar with, and if there weren't any built-in fail-safes to prevent manual overrides. Too many ifs. Disarming it wasn't an option, which meant the only thing left for them was to do... Run! Responding to this order, all three of them wheeled around and sprinted back down the halls the way they, the way they, had, they had come. Shay, Lee, Anderson shouted on, into his radio. Get to the elevator, now! Aye, aye, sir, one of them shouted back. Wait for us as long as possible, but if I give you the order, you go without us, is that understood? There was silence on the other end of the radio. The only sounds were the clomping boots and heavy breathing of the three Alliance soldiers sprinting down the hall. Private, do you hear me? If I say go, you damn well go, whether we're there or not. He was rewarded with a reluctant, Understood, sir. They were racing through the halls as fast as they could run, slipping and skidding around corners in a desperate attempt to beat out the timer that could go off at any moment. There wasn't time to check for enemy ambushes. They just had to hope they didn't run into one. Rounding the corner into the room where Anderson had earlier ordered Shay and Lee to wait for them, their luck finally ran out. Gunnery Chief Da was in the lead, her long legs allowing her to eat up extra ground with every stride, and she had pulled a few meters ahead of, of her two male companions. She ran full speed into the room and right into a spray of gunfire. The lone surviving Merc, a Batarian, was waiting for them. He must have stumbled into the room after Shay and Lee had pulled back to the elevator on Anderson's command. Since then, he'd been waiting patiently, just hoping for a chance to extract some form of, of petty revenge. The force of the bullets picked Daw off, off her feet and sent her crashing to the ground in a heap. 
Her forward momentum caused her body to somersault across the floor until she stopped, crumpled, motionless in the corner. Anderson was the second one into the room. He charged in with his weapon already firing. Normally, running straight at a stationary enemy with a loaded assault rifle was pure suicide, but the Merc had foolishly kept his attention on Daw as she tumbled and fell. He wasn't even looking in Anderson's direction. By the time he tried to spin around and fire back at his charging foe, the lieutenant was visually on top of him, so close that even while running, he was able to aim accurately enough to blow a hole in the battalion's chest. O'Reilly arrived a second, uh, split second later, coming to a stop when he saw Daw lying in a rapidly spreading pool of blood. Go, Anderson shouted at him. Go to the elevator. O'Reilly gave a curt nod and took off, leaving Anderson to check on their fallen comrade. The lieutenant dropped to one knee and rolled her over, then nearly jumped back in surprise when her eyes flickered open. Stupid bastard aimed too low, she said through gritted teeth. Took me, in the, uh, took me in the leg. Anderson glanced down and saw that it was true. A few stray bullets had penetrated the kinetic barriers protecting her torso only to ricochet off the heavy plates of her body armor, inflicting no damage beyond small dents and discolorations. But her right leg, where the armor was thinner and the highest concentration of fire had drained the shields, had been reduced to pulp and hamburger. You ever have a piggyback, chief? Anderson asked her, tossing his weapons to the ground and rapidly stripping off his own body armor. I was never a piggyback kind of girl, sir, she replied, snapping off her belt and discarding every piece of equipment that wasn't strapped on. Nothing to it, he explained, reaching down to, to help her into a sitting position. She still had her body armor on, but they'd already wasted too much time. All you gotta do is hold on. He did his best to help her wrap it her arms around his neck and shoulders, then stood up, momentarily staggering under the large woman's weight. He reached back to help support her weight, clutching her thighs and buttocks while her arms locked around his collar in fiercely strong grip. Giddy up, she grunted, doing her best to hide the agony the movement was inflicting on her mangled limb. Anderson took a few unsteady steps, struggling to find a way to move as quickly as possible while balancing the awkward load. By the time they emerged from the passage into the large stalactite-filled cavern, he had found an awkward but effective cadence somewhere between a gallop and a trot, and then the timer detonated. From the main laboratory in the heart of the research base, an enormous ball of heat, fire, and force burst loose, laying waste as, as it swept through the complex. Doors were warped and ripped off hinges. Floors buckled, walls melted. Far away in the natural cavern, the effects of the explosion were felt in three distinct stages. First, the ground seemed to heave under Anderson's feet, sending him tumbling to the ground. Doss screamed as her legs slammed against the floor, but her voice was drowned out by the second phase of the explosion, a deafening boom that echoed throughout the cavern and drowned out every other sound. The final phase was a wall of hot air propelled by the blast spilling out from the passage to roll over them, pinning them to the ground, burning their lungs and leaving them gasping for air. Anderson struggled to breathe, and for a second he nearly blacked out. He fought to maintain consciousness as the invisible hand squeezing his chest and pinning him to the ground slowly released its pressure, while the superheated air expelled by the blast did dispersed itself throughout the cavern. They weren't out of danger yet. The force of the blast had rocked, rocked the cavern. The strings of artificial lights ripped loose, swaying wildly and casting bizarre, crazy shadows throughout the room. And though his ears were still ringing, he could plainly hear the loud, sharp cracks of stress fractures appearing in the walls and ceilings as the cavern began to collapse. O'Reilly! He shouted into his radio, hoping the three men in the elevator could still hear him. This place is caving in. Get to the surface, now! What about you and Da? The reply was barely audible inside Anderson's helmet, though from the tone it was clear the corporal was shouting. Send the elevator back down after you get to the top, he snapped. Now move! That's an order! 
Not waiting for a reply, Anderson scrambled over to check on Gunnery Chief Da. She had passed out, the pain in her leg too much to bear on top of the physical trauma of the explosion's aftershocks. Summoning what was left of his strength, the lieutenant managed to stand up, slinging her over his shoulders in a fireman's carry. He began a desperate, staggering race to freedom as the chamber disintegrated around them. Stalactites plunged down like enormous jagged limestone spears. The fragile hold they had maintained on the ceiling for thousands of years finally failing. Huge cracks were spreading through the floor, walls, and roof, causing great chunks of rock to shear, shear off and tumble to the floor where they exploded into dust and rubble on impact. Anderson did his best to block it all out. There was nothing he could do but keep moving and pray they weren't crushed from above. So he forced his mind to focus solely on placing one foot in front of the other. He wasn't sure he was going to make it. The swinging strings of lights caused a strobe-like effect that made it difficult to keep his balance on the uneven ground. He was bruised and beaten from the concussion of the blast. Exhaustion and fatigue were setting in. The muscles in his thighs and calves were burning. The adrenaline rush he'd felt at the beginning of the mission was gone. His body simply had nothing left to give. He moved slower and slower, the unconscious woman draped over his shoulders, feeling as heavy as the massive slabs of rock raining down around them. When the elevator finally came into view, he wasn't surprised to see O'Reilly, Shay, and Lee still waiting for him. Seeing their commander staggering along like the living dead, all three of them rushed out to help. Anderson was too exhausted to object. He simply let Daw slide from his shoulders into the grasp of the two privates, one taking her under, under the shoulders and the other under the hips. With the burden removed, he lost his balance and nearly fell over, but O'Reilly was there to catch him. Leaning on the corporal for support, he managed to take the last 20 steps into the elevator before collapsing in the corner. The door slammed shut, and the car began the long journey up to the top. The ride was far from smooth. The elevator moved in fits and starts uh, as the gears screeched and squealed. Nobody said anything, as if they were afraid mentioning their precarious position might make it worse. Anderson simply lay where he had fallen, panting and wheezing as he tried to catch his breath. By the time they reached the top and spilled out into the safety of the surface, he had recovered enough to speak. Told you not to wait for us. He chastised his team as they made their way back to the Hastings, the privates still carrying Dawes' unconscious body between them. I should bust each of you down a full rank for disobeying orders. He paused to let the statement sink in. That will recommend you all for medals. That's it for Chapter 3. We'll see you guys next week with Chapter 4.